Good morning. I'm Alan Braverman. I'm an alumni endowed professor in cardiovascular diseases at Washington University and St. Louis School of Medicine and Barnes Jewish Hospital. Today, I'd like to present information about the bicuspid aortic valve and aortopathy, examining clinical features, imaging surveillance, and family screening, providing updates from the 2022 ACC AHA aortic disease guidelines. This information is provided by the GenTech Alliance Working Group on Patients, Families, and Clinicians to provide information to our community. The 2022 ACCHA guidelines provides a document uh, with information about management of all aortic diseases, uh, including thoracic and abdominal aortic disease and genetic aortopathy. Regarding information on bicuspid aortopathy, it's important to obtain an echocardiogram and imaging of the aorta for individuals with bicuspid valve disease. That's important because of the widespread manifestations of bicuspid valve and aortopathy conditions. The echocardiogram can survey and examine the bicuspid valve for its function, whether aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, coarctation of the aorta are present, and the severity of these valve lesions. The echocardiogram can characterize the phenotype of the bicuspid aortic valve and the degrees of valvular dysfunction. In addition, the echocardiogram can provide very valuable information on the aortic phenotype. The bicuspid valves associated with aortopathy and enlargement of the aorta typically involves the ascending aorta in about 70% having the ascending phenotype when aortopathy is present. Some have a diffuse enlargement of the aortic root and ascending aorta, and the root phenotype is a minority of individuals. So characterizing the phenotype and the size of the aorta by echocardiogram are very important. Now, when the entire extent of the ascending aorta is not adequately visualized by an echocardiogram, cross-sectional imaging with CT angiography or MR angiography is required to examine and measure the diameters of the aortic root and ascending aorta adequately. It's also important to screen family members. While bicuspid valve is present in 1% of the population, in family members of the pro band with bicuspid valve, it's recognized to be more common. So a class 2A recommendation, in other words, it's reasonable to screen all first degree relatives of the individual with a bicuspid aortic valve to evaluate for the presence of a bicuspid valve and to evaluate for dilatation of the aortic root, ascending aorta, or both. And in individuals with a bicuspid valve and a dilated aortic root or ascending aorta, a class one recommendation is given to screen all first degree relatives by echocardiogram to evaluate for bicuspid valve and to evaluate the aorta. Importantly, if the ascending aorta is not adequately visualized on echocardiogram in these families, CT or MRI is indicated to look for familial aneurysm disease. In family studies, the prevalence of bicuspid valve in the first degree relative of an individual with a BAV is up to nine to 10%. And aortic enlargement has been documented in first degree relatives of the proband with the bicuspid valve, even when the valve in that relative is tricuspid with a variable prevalence. And the largest study to date from the group in Barcelona examined 722 first degree relatives of 256 bicuspid valve patients, reporting a 6% incidence of bicuspid valve in these relatives and almost 10% with isolated aortic dilation. So this inheritance pattern of BAV is consistent with an autosomal dominant pattern with reduced penetrance. But monozygotic twins do not necessarily both have bicuspid valves, highlighting the incomplete penetrance of this disorder. And a recent analysis found that uh, echocardiographic screening of the first degree relatives of affected uh, patients with bicuspid valve to detect bicuspid valve and aortopathy is cost effective. The guidelines also provide the importance of looking for genetic aortopathy amongst those with bicuspid valve disease. So that those with bicuspid valve and a heritable thoracic aortic disease in a family or phenotypic features concerning for Loewy's Dietz syndrome, a medical genetics evaluation is recommended. In the population of those with bicuspid valve, some have aneurysm disease. And of the bicuspid with aneurysm, some are syndromic like those with Loewy's Dietz and then other genes that can relate to bicuspid valve and aneurysm disease. And of course, Turner syndrome associates with BAV and about 
of Turner women. Non-syndromic heritable thoracic disease with familial bicuspid valve and aneurysms can run in families and uh, infrequently have one of these gene variants or others being recognized. In those with Lowy's D syndrome, due to pathogenic variants in one of the five genes recognized to be able to cause the Lowy's Dietz phenotype, there is a higher prevalence of BAV than the general population, reported variably between 3 and 17 percent. When we examined bicuspid valve and Lowy's Dietz patients in the Montel Chino Aorta Consortium entered from our university site, you can see that there is an increased prevalence of bicuspid valves amongst some of the Lowy's Dietz genes. So we'll look for the features of an underlying syndromic uh, genetic aortopathy in individuals with bicuspid valve, especially with root phenotype. Let's look at the skin, the skeleton, cranial facial features to see if there's a syndromic uh, pattern here that could correlate with Lowy's Dietz or other. So while the bicuspid valve is heritable, the genetic causes are elusive, and in most individuals with BAV and thoracic aneurysm, there's no genetic variant discovered. And variants in the genes that can lead to Lowy's Dietz are not more common amongst non-syndromic bicuspid valve patients, even with aortic enlargement. So this represents a small subsegment of BAV and aneurysms. When to consider genetic testing, BAV with phenotypic, feeder, uh, with phenotypic features of syndromic heritable thoracic disease, then genetic testing can be useful. So again, look for the subtle features. In patients with bicuspid valve and root phenotype aneurysms with significant aortic dilation or aneurysm in young individuals, think of genetic testing, and those with bicuspid valve that have family histories of thoracic aneurysm disease. Finally, imaging surveillance is required long-term in individuals with bicuspid valve to watch for and examine and survey for aortic dilatation. The rate of aortic enlargement in BAV is variable, typically less than a millimeter a year, but larger aortic uh, aneurysms grow more rapidly in BAV. So there's a variable rate of growth. And amongst a cohort of adult patients followed at the uh, Mayo Clinic, those with a bicuspid valve mean age of 55 without aneurysm at baseline, 13% developed thoracic aneurysm at 15 years after diagnosis, and the 25-year risk of a thoracic aneurysm was about 26%. So routine imaging surveillance for BAV patients is uh, uh, necessary in those with aortas of four centimeters or greater for lifelong surveillance of the root and ascending aorta by imaging to adequately evaluate the aortic root and ascending aorta at an interval dependent upon the diameter and rate of growth. And after valve repair or replacement for the BAV patient in whom the aorta is left behind, lifelong surveillance imaging is required at an interval dependent upon the aortic diameter and rate of growth to observe for any aortic consequences such as aneurysmal dilatation. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, participation in this educational um, um, report on the bicuspid valve with aortopathy, clinical features, imaging and family screening, updates from the 2022 ACC AHA aortic guidelines. Thank you very much.